Last month, I did a little retrospective on the straight-to-DVD movie era of Futurama, and I had a ton of fun reflecting on what I liked and didn't like about that little middle section of Futurama's lifespan. So I figured, we might as well make this a trilogy and cover the Fox and Comedy Central eras in separate retrospectives. But we're gonna do this Star Wars style and go with the prequels next, so join me as I go... Back in time. All the way back to the mid-90s, when they conceived of and began to write Futurama. That's right, we're gonna cover the golden era of Futurama, the Fox seasons, the Robo Creme de la Robo Creme, the standard definition tearjerkers, the funny but also thinky sci-fi fun stravaganza. Futurama's first 72 episodes on Fox gets its own retrospective starting right after I talk about today's sponsor, Surfshark. Surfshark VPN is a super cool and helpful tool that can protect your information from data thieves and secure your online life. On top of that, Surfshark can help you unlock tons of content on streaming services like Netflix by logging in through a different country. So if you've run out of cartoons to watch on the US's Netflix library, no sweat, try out Australia or Japan. You can find shows like Rick and Morty, Archer, Close Enough, and more. One subscription gives you access to Surfshark on unlimited devices so you can load it up on your PC, phone, tablet, Mac, you name it. Plus, there's a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's plenty of time to make sure Surfshark is right for you. I've even got a special offer code for you that will get you 83% off and three extra months on top of that for free. Just go to the link in the description of this video and enter the promo code CELLOS to get this awesome offer. All right, let's go back to the future. Obviously, it's impossible to talk about Futurama without first talking about the adult animation juggernaut The Simpsons, both created by cartoonist Matt Groening. After The Simpsons' instantaneous and monumental success, Fox wanted another one, and why wouldn't they? So around 1996, Groening enlisted Simpsons writer and sci-fi fanatic David X. Cohen to help develop a new comedic science fiction series for Fox. What came out of that was Futurama, after a long and painful development and pitching process. But eventually, Fox picked up the series for a 13-episode inaugural season. When I say that Futurama had a tumultuous history, that would be a major understatement. From the get-go, Fox had concerns over the premise and wanted more creative control than they had over The Simpsons, a notion that Groening outright rejected. Groening seemed very confident in their vision for the show. So with The Simpsons, that was my take on The American Family. So what I've done to The American Family with The Simpsons we're gonna do to science fiction with Futurama. In spite of the struggles to get the show up and running, they managed to put together an incredible writer's room and voice cast. The writer's room consisted of many Simpsons alum as well as newcomers, but most notable was the sheer amount of cumulative education the staff had. There were three PhDs and seven master's degrees in the writing staff alone, which shined through in a lot of its science-focused humor. And the winner is... Number three in a quantum finish. No fair! You change the outcome by measuring it. But the cast was really something special, gathering some of the most talented voice performers in the business. Billy West played an avalanche of characters, including Fry, Zoidberg, and the Professor. Katie Seagal was perfect as Taranga Leela. John DiMaggio literally stole the show as Bender. And then rounding out the cast were Phil Lamar, Lauren Tom, Maurice LaMarche, and Tress McNeil. Truly one of the most legendary voice casts that has ever existed. And that cast almost included the incomparable Phil Hartman, who sadly passed before he could fill the role of Zap Brannigan. So with such a top-notch writing staff and voice cast, why did the show have so much trouble with the network and with audiences? Well, there are a few reasons for this. Futurama was basically The Simpsons' younger sibling, and being the follow-up to arguably the most popular show of all time is a lot to live up to. The audience already goes in with a certain type of expectation, and I think for a lot of people, these expectations weren't immediately met, or the true nature of the show wasn't immediately understood. But Fox didn't really help in this matter either. They opted to shuffle Futurama's scheduled airtime multiple times over its run on the network. The show was persistently pulled from the schedule due to sporting events that ran long, and their erratic release ultimately led to the four produced seasons of Futurama being spread out over five broadcast seasons instead. But in spite of these obstacles, Futurama managed to accumulate a very dedicated audience over its time on Fox. Though its saving grace would ultimately be Adult Swim, who started syndicating the series alongside Family Guy. This consistent time slot grew the show's audience exponentially and in the end saved the series. But let's back it up again and talk about the actual content of seasons 1 through 4, because that's really what I'm here to do. The production and history of the show is totally fascinating stuff, but the thing we're all interested in is the show itself. So I'm going to talk about the show in the format and order that it was intended to be watched in. Though the show ended up shuffling the order and releasing five broadcast seasons, which you might be familiar with if you watch the show on Hulu, I'm going to be talking about each of the first four production seasons as they were produced. 
So let's start with where it all began. December 31st, 1999. Or actually, March 28th, 1999. That's when the episode aired. Space Pilot 3000 will go down in history as one of the greatest pilots of all time. The episode so expertly sets up our main characters, the premise of the series, and the setting with an efficiency rarely seen in TV. Just from the cold open alone, we're introduced to Philip J. Fry, understand his place in the world, see the inciting incident for the entire series, and are introduced to the overall premise. It's so, so incredibly well written. Parents. My co-workers, my girlfriend, I'll never see any of them again. Yahoo! This pilot should be studied ad nauseum by up-and-coming writers, but even after the cold open, the episode introduces us to both Tarangalila and Bender Bending Rodriguez, establishing their own fears and insecurities naturally and effectively. Uh, you chip. What are you doing? Quitting. Why? Because I've always wanted to. Wait, you're the only friend I have. You really want a robot for a friend? One of my favorite shots in the entire series is this introductory shot of New New York as Fry ventures out into his new surroundings for the first time. It so perfectly establishes this weird retro future that Futurama would become known for. Hover cars, weird billboards, giant pneumatic tubes, all of these things add to the charm of the world that they were building. It never feels like an unrecognizable world of future tech, it's all vaguely familiar with a futuristic twist. And this was intentional. The point was that though this series took place in the future, they needed the audience to still find it relatable. It was taking modern problems and reflecting them through a futuristic mirror. So like I said, this pilot is one of the all-time greats, beautifully establishing characters, setting and premise in a hilarious and efficient package, and also a glimpse of the heart the show would become known for. My parents abandoned me here as a baby and I don't even know what galaxy they were from. I know how it feels to be alone. And the continued introduction of the world of tomorrow was paced perfectly. The second episode, the series has landed, introduces us to our secondary characters, Amy, Hermes, and Zoidberg, and also brings the crew off world for the very first time, albeit not very far, just the moon. But the slow reveal of how big the Futurama universe could be was welcomed, because there was simply so much to establish in the expansive landscape of the series. And while the second episode is absolutely hilarious, it reaffirms that the show is going to have an emotional core that tugged at the heartstrings. This episode was so smart because it tried to show us this new and exciting future through Fry's eyes. The moon was like this awesome, romantic, mysterious thing hanging up there in the sky where you could never reach it, no matter how much you wanted to. God, I just really love that scene. And the first season is immaculately paced. The third episode, I Roommate, firmly establishes Fry's friendship with Bender, as well as gives him a place to live, something that we needed to know as he was thrust into the future. Love's Labor's Lost in Space introduces Zap Brannigan and establishes a lot of Leela's long-standing character traits and long-standing regrets. It also brings in Nibbler, who would play a big role later. They just did a great job introducing us to what the show had to offer offer without wasting any real time, and slowly began to move the crew further and further away from Earth, landing on alien worlds in Love's Labor's Lost in Space, Fear of a Bot Planet, and My Three Sons. But they also weren't afraid to do hilarious, grounded stories simply set in New New York. A Fishful of Dollars shows Fry become a billionaire thanks to the interest in his bank account over 1,000 years, and though they obviously needed to re-establish the status quo and make him lose all of his money, it was a really funny and interesting character study. Plus, it introduced us to the longtime antagonist of the series, Mom. They also made an effort, even this early on, to have pro-environmental messages in the show. A Big Piece of Garbage is probably my favorite episode of the first season, and it introduces a hilarious sci-fi concept in the midst of an anti-pollution driven plotline. They actually kind of laid it on thick too, it's pretty funny. Were it not for your 20th century garbage making skills, we'd all be buried under 20th century garbage. Now, not every season one episode was a banger. A Flight to Remember was ironically maybe not all that memorable. Mars University had some funny stuff in it, but didn't leave a huge impact on me personally, but we also got episodes like Hell is Other Robots, which to this day is considered one of the best the show has to offer, introducing the incredible side character the Robot Devil, who would go on to play major parts in important episodes of the series. He was also played by the legend Dan Castellaneta, aka Homer Simpson. And can we talk about the song? Here on level one of Robot Hell. The season even rounded out with one of their most beloved parodies, Fry and the Slurm Factory, a play on Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And while I prefer the more original stories in Futurama to the straight up parodies, it's hard not to love this episode. Runka, lunka, dunka, dee, darm guards. Shut the hell up! 
All in all, Futurama started off strong. The animation itself was a bit looser than you'd come to expect later, but much less so than first seasons of shows like The Simpsons, Family Guy, or King of the Hill. It also would establish our characters and our world building in incredibly effective ways, and it tugged at the heartstrings through that emotional core that I continued to mention. But things would really only get better from there because season two continued to grow the series in hilarious and memorable ways. Though I think that season two maybe dials back on the emotional core a tad bit after getting so many great moments in season one, it absolutely dials up the comedy and sci-fi in really funny ways. The first episode of the season, I Second That Emotion, introduces us to the mutants who live under New York, and even throws a little Easter egg in the mix for long-running mystery in the series. They pretty immediately expand on characters like Zap Brannigan and Brannigan Begin Again, and firmly establish him as a comedic powerhouse. What makes a man turn neutral? Lust for gold? Power? Or were you just born with a heart full of neutrality? And of course, they introduced the character who would maintain his position as president of Earth throughout the remainder of the series, Richard Nixon. Overall, season two does a ton right. Episodes that put a focus on secondary characters like Brannigan Begin Again, Why Must I Be a Crustacean in Love, and How Hermes Requisitioned His Groove Back showed that the series didn't need to just rely on its primary characters for effective storytelling. Interestingly, season two doesn't overly rely on pure sci-fi either, opting to take a lot of fun sitcom ideas, concepts, and themes, and rolling in a sci sci-fi twist. Xmas Story takes the Christmas episode concept and adds in a murderous rampaging robot Santa who has been programmed to judge everyone as naughty. Put Your Head on My Shoulders throws Fry and Amy into a surprise relationship. The typical sitcom idea here would generally be that when they break up, they have to deal with working in close quarters at Planet Express, but instead Futurama dials that up a notch and has Fry's disembodied head temporarily attached to Amy, making their breakup that much more difficult. Why Must I Be a Crustacean in Love has Fry attempt to coach Zoidberg in his dating life, with the added caveat that Zoidberg's alien species has a drastically different form of procreation. It's a really fun formula that they would continue to use effectively through to the end of the series. Season 2 also started to dig a bit more into some long-running mysteries and storylines. While there was a nice moment in Season 1's A Flight to Remember, Xmas Story was probably the first big step in the Fry and Leela romance that would run through to the finale of the show. What I love about this episode is that it firmly establishes Fry and Leela's connection outside of romance. It's initially a purely platonic bond formed through their mutual loneliness. While Fry lamented the fact that he left all of his friends and family back Back in the year 2000, Leela similarly lamented her lifetime as an orphan who never knew her parents. Here I am whining like a pig, while all along Leela was as lonely as a frog. And yeah, the episode does have them almost kiss when they were faced with what they believed to be imminent death, but the moment that I think meant the most to their development was this one. Leela! Oh my god! You saved my life! I am gonna get you so many lizards! <laughs> nah, just kidding. Actually, this one. It's okay. You're lonely and I'm lonely. But together... We're lonely together. The show really established itself as being willing to slow down and embrace these smaller, grounded, and emotional character moments, and I think that's what made it both stand out and allowed it to stand the test of time, especially given that a lot of these character arcs would be serialized throughout the run, something you didn't really see from network animated sitcoms back in the day. Speaking of serialized character arcs, they also really started to dig into the mystery of Leela's origins in the season two. Besides the moment in Xmas story that focused on her loneliness, there was also the aforementioned mutant hint in episode 201, but most prominently was the episode of Bicycle Cyclops built for two, in which Leela believes that she has found the only other remaining member of her species. We are the last remaining Cyclopses. Our planet is Cyclopia. This is the capital, Cyclops City. Stop me if I'm going too fast for you. It's a really great episode that shows how important Leela's desire to find a sense of belonging in her origins and history is to her. Because though she meets this other Cyclops and has an opportunity to save her species, she also quickly learns that he's an asshole and that she doesn't like him. It's a tough scenario where Leela's head and heart are at odds with one another. In the end, it turns out that the other Cyclops, Alcazar, was a con man and not a Cyclops at all, so they didn't go through with the marriage. But the episode went a long way to show how important finding where she came from is to Leela. And I would be hard-pressed not to talk about the problem with Poplar is probably one of the most popular episodes of Futurama. Honestly, before Futurama became one of my favorite series, this was the episode that always came to mind when I thought about the show. It's just a straight-up good time. Pop a poplar in your mouth when you come to Fishy Joe's. What they're made of is a mystery where they come from. No one knows. The episode combines a really fun and unique premise with a great sci-fi twist when they realize that the food they've been collecting and selling is actually the offspring of an alien species. The episode also establishes what would be a long-running bit, the Waterfall Family, as Free Waterfall Jr. fights for animal rights. We're with mankind for ethical animal treatment. And of course gets eaten by Lur of the planet Omicron per CI8. This is not happening. <laughs> Though I think my absolute favorite sequence in all of season two has to be the finale musical number in How Hermes Requisitioned His Groove Back. Just an incredibly fun song with so many memorable lines, but also really well directed and animated. 
So like I said, while Season 2 maybe dialed back a tad on the emotional core of the series, it didn't abandon it entirely, and it also just continued to cement the show as a smart comedic juggernaut, all while establishing some of the most beloved and memorable through lines that the series had to offer. It was an excellent sophomore effort that would pave the way for what is, in my opinion, the strongest run of the show with Season 3. Futurama's third production season, right off the bat, hit us with what many consider to be one of the strongest episodes of the series, Amazon Women in the Mood. While I'm not quite as high on this episode as many others, I do think it's hard to deny that it's very funny. A great follow-up to a couple of ongoing stories, Leela's repulsion for Zap Brannigan, and of course, Kiff and Amy's budding romance, this one pretty immediately hit the show with some incredible humor. Ah, uh, she's built like a steakhouse, but she handles like a bistro. And while I find that the differences between men and women humor that it overly relies on didn't quite age as well as a lot of of the other humor in the show, there are some really great moments. But the second episode the season has to offer, Parasites Lost, is in my opinion one of the absolute finest the show has ever produced. I can't express how much I love this episode. When Fry gets parasitic worms that basically push his body and mind to operate at peak efficiency, the crew does their own fantastic voyage to try and eliminate the worms from his system. Where are we, the ass? But Fry's newfound mental clarity also helps Leela see his potential, and Fry confesses his love. Leela. I love you. This is a plot point that would continue to be important through the entire series, that Fry and Leela have an undeniable connection and bond, but Fry's immaturity poses issues with his viability as boyfriend material, and though their romance in Parasite's Lost goes incredibly well, including one of the most beautiful sequences in the series when Fry plays the holophoner for Leela, Fry worries that Leela only loves him for what the worms have made him. Fry wants to get there on his own. Oh Fry, I love what you've become. What I've become. Fry eliminating the worms from his own system is bold and heartbreaking, and also just such a fun science fiction idea. He's bluffing! No creature would willingly make an idiot out of itself! Obviously you've never been in love! I can't express enough how much I love this episode. But we've got to move on because literally two episodes later is one of the absolute greatest episodes of television history, honestly. And what was for a long time my favorite episode of the entire run of Futurama, The Luck of the Fryrish. I cannot say enough about this episode. It's truly one of the most well-written pieces of television I've ever seen. Absolutely hilarious, but maintains an honest and emotional character through line with Fry's anger over his past with his brother, who he now believes stole his identity after he disappeared. That clover helped my rat fink brother steal my dream of going into space. Now I'll never get there. You went there this morning for donuts. This was the first time the show really utilized flashbacks to Fry's past and its story structure, something they would do a few more times over the series. But the end of the episode is where it really delivers the strong emotional gut punch. Fry learns that his brother, in fact, did not steal his identity. He actually named his son after Fry. I'm naming you Philip J. Fry in honor of my little brother, who I miss every day. God, that just hurts every damn time to watch. What a good episode. And this was literally all within four episodes of the third season. Not every episode of this run was a banger, but it absolutely has a collection of some of the best episodes the show has to offer. The Day the Earth Stood Stupid started to explore a long-standing mystery that David Cohen and co. had planned from the very beginning, the idea that Fry had been sent to the future because he had a role to play with universal implications. And this creates for a very fun episode with giant brains that make everyone except for Fry very dumb. Ow! Fire hot! The prophecy will help! Fire indeed hot! We'll talk more about this as they follow it up, but it's another really strong episode in season 3. The season is also filled with what I consider to be very underrated classics, like Insane in the Mainframe, when Fry and Bender are both sent to a robot insane asylum. This one introduces Roberto, who is truly one of the funniest side characters ever created. Now stand back, I gotta practice my stabbing! Ha <laughs> ha! Bendin' in the Wind is another that I feel is very underrated, utilizing its guest voice musician Beck in hilarious ways that actually build on what we know about Bender as a character. It's really fun stuff. With real words, not phony ones like Odile. Odile is a word. Just look it up in the Beckionary. And the season closes out with some of the show's best episodes. The final nine episodes include three all-timers, Time Keeps on Slippin', Roswell That Ends Well, and Godfellas, as well as the very underrated Future Stock. Time Keeps on Slippin' is another that follows up the Fry and Leela romance arc in exciting and heartbreaking ways, all through another amazing sci-fi premise in which time starts to skip ahead at random intervals, causing a mass confusion. It also establishes the Globetrotters as a hilarious group of side characters, and of course ends with one of the most heartbreaking moments of the series. During a time skip, Fry 
Fry somehow wins over Leela and the two get married, but because time skipped, neither of them remember how or why it happened, resulting in their immediate divorce. As the episode closes, Fry sees exactly what he did to win over Leela, moving the stars themselves to write her a love note just before it's destroyed forever, with Leela never seeing the message. Big oof. Roswell That Ends Well is another of the most beloved and memorable episodes of the show as well, and it even won Futurama their very first Emmy Award. The episode attempts to explain the infamous Roswell, New Mexico UFO incident through the Planet Express crew's accidental time travel, which creates for some absolutely hilarious moments in the past, obviously an era that we had yet to see in the series. Fellas, this visit's top secret. No one's to know about it, except the senior officers, scientists, and a single conspiracy not to no one will believe. But what makes this episode most memorable is the so-called nasty in the pasty, where we learned that Fry accidentally became his own grandfather. Did you say something, dearie? This also ultimately explains why Fry was so important in saving the universe from the brain spawn. Being his own grandfather is why he has no Delta brainwave and why he can survive their dumbification. And then Godfellas is just a damn work of art, an episode I've loved for as long as I can remember. Bender is accidentally launched through space and first he becomes a god and then he meets a god. It's a beautiful and existential episode that builds on Bender's own insecurities as a character who craves validation through a desire to be loved and remembered. And Ultimately, Bender being loved and remembered by his best friend Fry is what saved him from a cruel fate of eternal floating. I wish I had Bender back. Wish I had Bender back. The show was starting to get really ambitious, as the last three episodes I talked about really establish, and it continued to just knock these episodes out of the park, too. But that isn't to say that season three was perfect, either. It maybe ends a little underwhelmingly with the 30% Iron Chef, a decent episode, but not the most exciting finale. Even though it establishes a new character, Hermie's son Dwight, The Route of All Evil stands out to me as a pretty lackluster episode, and Where the Bugalo Roam is not only a pretty mediocre episode comedically, it's full of really frustrating and problematic Native American stereotypes that play as both offensive and lazy. It's definitely one of my least favorite episodes. But season three was basically when Futurama hit its stride and really showcased its potential to the highest degree. It has probably six or seven episodes that sit in my top 15 of the entire show. And it also just fully took hold of that emotional core that the show is known for, leaning hard into strong emotional character moments, all while never sacrificing the incredible comedy or sci-fi. And this is a trend that would continue into Futurama's final season of its original run on Fox. Though I think this final run doesn't quite hit with the same consistency of season three, it has some of the best episodes of the show. While the season maybe starts off a little weak overall, with the first six episodes of the season having five episodes that I think are average or below, there's Kiff Gets Knocked Up a Notch, Love and Rocket, Less Than Hero, and A Taste of Freedom. All are fine episodes, but nothing to write home about. But it also gave us Leela's Homeworld, an episode that the entire series had been building up to. I actually did an entire video on this episode, but it's hard to overstate just how excellent Leela's Homeworld is. The episode finally reveals exactly where Leela came from, and though we had been led to believe the entire run that she was an alien, abandoned on Earth as a child, it turns out that she is actually a mutated human, the least mutated mutant of all time, in fact, which led to her parents deciding to leave her in an orphanarium on the surface to give her a better life than she could hope to achieve in the sewers. It's an incredibly heartwarming episode and an absolutely masterful reveal, one of the best the show has ever had. The ending showcases a montage where we see that for her entire life, Leela's parents had actually been watching out for her, even though she didn't realize it, and it stands as one of the most emotionally affecting sequences in all of Futurama. I could go on for a while about this episode, but I already did that in the other video, so if you want to hear more about why this reveal was so effective, check that one out. And speaking of emotionally affecting, we've arrived at the most infamous episode of Futurama, Jurassic Bark. Yeah, it's the one with Fry's dog. So get your tissues ready. This was the second time the series utilized these flashbacks to Fry's past and the story structure, and once again, it worked incredibly well. Fry discovers the fossilized remains of his dog in a museum exhibit, and then has an opportunity to bring him back from the dead with Farnsworth's help. Know ye now what it feels like to be dog god! Fry ultimately changes his mind when he learns that Seymour lived a long life, but ho oh boy, I know I don't have to remind you about this emotional gut punch. I'll never forget him, but he forgot me a long, long time ago. This obviously turned out to not be true, as we see at the end of the episode that Seymour actually waited the remainder of his life for Fry to return. No joke, it makes me tear up just writing those words in the script right now. It's one of the most painful moments I've ever seen in television, and I think a lot of people agree with me there. The episode is great for many other reasons too. It's very funny, but also has an important subplot focusing on Bender's insecurities once again, as he becomes jealous of Fry's excitement to reconnect with Seymour. But obviously it's remembered for that ending. I don't think there are any episodes of the show that 
that had a more lasting impact on its fandom than Jurassic Park. The season would continue in its ambition, too. The why of Fry follows up the Brainspawn story as Fry has to stop the giant floating brains once and for all, but not before he learns the terrible truth that the writers had planned from the very beginning. Fry had actually been pushed into the freezer by Nibbler, who needed Fry to exist in the future so that he could stop the Brainspawn. Fry basically learns that the most important event in his life was not actually just happenstance, but something that somebody did to him. It's pretty emotional. You were the only one who could help us. What is one life weighed against the entire universe? But it was my life. Fry is actually given a chance to change the past, but opts not to, because of his friends and Leela specifically. It's a really, really nice moment, especially in what was looking like it would be the final season of Futurama. The entire back half of this final Fox season has some really strong stuff. Teenage Mutant Leela's Hurdles, where no fan has gone before, and 300 Big Boys stand out as incredibly fun episodes that probably get overlooked. The Farnsworth Parabox is without a doubt one of the best the show has ever made, with not only an amazing sci-fi premise, but with some incredible funny comedic moments. One year later, I gave Leela a diamond scrunchie and we were married. One year later, I got beat up at a Neil Diamond concert by a guy named Scrunchie. But the episode that I really want to talk about is The Sting, which I believe to be one of the greatest pieces of television that has ever graced our screens. It's truly something so unbelievably special. I know you've all watched the show before, so you know the twist, but the gist is that the episode all takes place in Leela's trippy coma dream, in which she thinks Fry has been killed, sacrificing himself to save her. It has some of my favorite sequences in animation history, and the entire episode has this sort of scary, dreamy vibe that we've never seen in any other episode of Futurama. I I love you. I'm so scared, Fry. I don't know what to do. Just wake up, Leela. Please, just wake up. But the ultimate reveal, that it was all Leela's coma dream, is so ridiculously effective, and not just because it was a surprising twist, but because of the subtle details in the end of the episode that tie everything together so beautifully. Leela dreams that Fry gave her a gift, and that he put her jacket on her when she was cold, and that they were traveling together on a sleigh through these ice fields. The end of the episode shows that Fry had left a gift at her nightstand, that he had put his jacket around her while she was sleeping, and that the television was showcasing those very ice fields that they traveled through in the dream. Fry sat at Leela's side and spoke to her the entire time. It got through, Fry. It got through. It's just one of the most brilliantly conceived episodes of anything I've ever seen, and it all ties into our ongoing investment in Fry and Leela's connection. It's my favorite episode of Futurama, and I honestly can't say that enough times. But though this season does have some of Futurama's best efforts, it also has some low points. I mentioned before that the season starts a little slowly with a slew of average or forgettable episodes, but it also features probably the worst episode of the show, Bend Her, which is just fundamentally transphobic and a huge bummer. I was never a huge fan of this one outside of the introduction of Barbados slim, but it's aged even worse than you can imagine, and I genuinely just skip over it when I rewatch the show. Honestly, as great as Futurama is, it definitely had its brushes with homophobic and transphobic humor, even in strong episodes. Obviously, this was the case for a lot of shows that aired in this era, but Futurama being such a strong and in a lot of other ways progressive show, it's a bummer to see. Obviously, that isn't to say the show can't be enjoyed in spite of these jokes, it's just important to acknowledge them. But with that, let's talk about the very first series finale the show ever had, and another of my absolute favorite episodes, probably in my top three. The Devil's Hands Are Idle Playthings ended Futurama for the first time on the best imaginable note. This episode is not only so funny, but so emotionally impacting in a way that leaves you somehow paradoxically satisfied and desperate to see what comes next. It's an incredible episode of television and a really strong finale. Fry makes a deal with the robot devil and swaps hands with him so that he can play the holophoner well again, all in an attempt to win over Leela once and for all. With his new hands, Fry becomes an incredible musician and writes an entire opera about Leela and his love for her. It all culminates in the robot devil's own trickery. Through a deal with Bender, he causes Leela to become deaf, and then tricks Leela into trading him her hand in marriage so that she can hear Fry's opera for her. Fry then must choose between losing the woman he loves or losing the hands that made her fall in love with him in the first place. Just a masterfully written deal with the devil storyline. The end of the Fox era of Futurama is perfect. It's one of the best moments the series has to offer, as Fry sits down and plays one last song for Leela, even though he's lost his skill. Please don't stop playing, Fry. I want to hear how it ends. The series ends for the first time with Fry playing music for Leela, and a vision of himself and Leela kissing and walking off into the sunset together. And then, it was over. For a long time, 
This was the final piece of Futurama that ever existed. And though when I was younger, all I ever wanted was to see what happened next, I do think that if this had been the very end for Futurama, I would have ultimately been satisfied. It's such a good episode that gives us a glimpse at a possible future for our characters, all while celebrating the journey they've gone on. They absolutely stuck the landing with this episode. The Fox era of Futurama, in my opinion, is one of the greatest stretches of television writing that has ever existed. No, it isn't perfect. There are some lackluster episodes and even some dated and problematic stories that don't age well, but it's hard to deny what the show was able to accomplish in its four production seasons. Emerging from the shadow of The Simpsons to establish itself as its own special and unique type of animated sitcom, experimenting with types of storytelling that hadn't really been heard of in network sitcom format at the time, and really embracing an emotional character-based type of storytelling that would keep fans coming back for more, even fighting through their own tears. It's hard to describe how much I love and appreciate this original run of Futurama, and while there are stories and episodes that I absolutely love from the remaining eras of the show, the DVD movies and the Comedy Central seasons, the Fox run will always be what Futurama is for me. There's just something special about these stories and these characters, and I think that this was felt in its fan base, because though shows like The Simpsons might be bigger, it's hard to think of a more dedicated and invested fan base than Futurama, a fan base that stuck with them through multiple cancellations and revivals, and to this day will watch an idiot like me ramble about the show thousands of times. The golden era of Futurama was truly something special. Folks, thanks so much for tuning in to another Futurama retrospective. Expect another one on the final revival era of Futurama, eventually. Not sure when I'll get to that one, but let me know how badly you want it, and maybe it will convince me to move faster. If you haven't seen it yet, make sure to check out my video on the movie era of the show as well. Also, check out the podcast, Cartoons That Curse. We've covered a lot of Futurama on there, including the first four seasons and the first four movies. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll catch you next time. Peace. Johnny Futurama. Thank you.